Um, and Jacob, since you're such a Zoom whiz, um, I'm wondering if you can answer the question for me. So right now, in terms of what I see, I see everybody, which I know means I'm on like whatever that's called, the other view where you see people. When Dion and I move into talking, we're going to have a discussion and is, and if we do speaker view, then what happens is, because I'm thinking about the way I'm going to record this for Facebook, yeah. if we do speaker view, is it that she shows up, I show up, or how does that work? Yeah, it'll, well, actually for the recording, it'll just do that anyway. It doesn't show up what's on our screen. It'll oh, really? show who's talking. Yes. Oh, wow. See, did you know that, Dion? No, oh, I did not. <laughs> so, Jacob's the Zoom whiz. Awesome. Okay, Jacob, Fantastic. thank you for being the Zoom whiz. Okay, Dustin, is everybody in the room? You're the attendance keeper. Um, not quite yet. I think we're still missing about two people. I don't okay. see Ashley or, um, uh, I think that's. So let's wait for our two people. Can we have, is it just Ashley? I know Elizabeth is in here, but she said that she sent Professor an email. Yeah, I got that message okay. too. Oh, I didn't. I didn't check email. So just so she won't be here. So we're just waiting for Ashley currently. Katie, would you send Ashley a text and yep, can do just that. kind of be like, "Hey," um, just be like, "Hey." <laughs> That's all you have to do is just say, "Hey." All right, so we're gonna start. Um, I'm gonna try to record, or I guess I'm recording. Okay, so first of all, I'm a little extra excited because Dion and I were students at Indiana University Bloomington together. I was a year ahead. We were fiercely competitive, weren't we? <laughs> We haven't admitted it until this point. <laughs> Just a little bit, maybe. We were both practicing 5,000 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. And we were both slaying it. We were slaying it in all the ways that you shouldn't slay it, because we all know that you shouldn't practice 5,000 5, hours a day. Right, Dion? Yes. No more. No more. <laughs> we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about why you shouldn't behave the way we behave. Yes. <laughs> Very unhealthy for your mental state and your body. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. Don't do it. Um, so we're going to have a great conversation about like life as college students, life as, you know, colleagues. And then I went off to Germany on a Fulbright, which had been a goal of mine since I was 14. Like I was going to get a Fulbright and go to Germany. And the next year, Dion went off to Paris with a Fulbright. Because you inspired me. I would have never done that if you hadn't gone to Germany. Yeah. So you, really. I know about the Fulbright. I remember telling you, be like, oh man, now she's going to go get a Fulbright. I know it. <laughs> well, and, and I remember Peter Lloyd, who was our teacher, saying, well, they're pr probably not going to give two Fulbrights to two flutists like two years in a row. It's just not going to happen, you know? And so I was like, well. But we did it, Dion. We did it. Of course, it would be us. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really great. I mean, we were just like, um, you know, both really hardworking and we had strong passions like all of the people in our studio do. This studio is incredible, Dion. You were here, what, four years ago? Yeah. I could hear it in your students' recordings. Fantastic. They sound yeah. so good. Yeah. So inspiring. After every lesson, I feel like I have to go practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But we don't want to practice, right? We're done with that. I'm getting over that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's a little bit of background on us, and so now Dion is, uh, I'll let you talk a little bit about what what you're doing, what you've done professionally, just kind of a microcosm of it, and then we'll go into more detail later. And then we're going to move into um, the masterclass portion, which we're trying to keep kind of short, because I think the most valuable thing we're going to get out of today, other than some great tips for the two selections, is really this discussion, okay? We're gonna talk about study abroad. We're gonna talk about um, Fulbrights, how to like live for free on somebody else's money. <laughs> <laughs> we're 
Like, did you know the Fulbright actually pays you to be alive? Like, you, they pay your rent, they pay your schooling, and then they pay you to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about all that. Uh, but first, Dion, would you give us a little recap of your life, your professional life? Yeah, sure. Um, so I started, you know, flute very young. My dad was a jazz pianist, so I was, I grew up around music and I wanted to start playing flute when I was six. And he said, no, no, you can't. It's too early. You're too young and you must learn piano first. And I was kind of like, ugh, but I did. So I took piano lessons for two years. And then finally in fourth grade, when I could go into the band program, I started playing the flute and it was just a huge passion. Um, I just fell in love with it. And I, every day I woke up and I just couldn't wait to practice. And that went on for many, many, many years. Um, and luckily I was fortunate enough to study with Nina at IU with Peter Lloyd. I mean, I really think he's one of the most amazing, most supportive teachers and a wonderful man. And he just really encouraged us. And I don't know if you remember Nina, how I had that crooked embouchure and he wouldn't let me play for a year. He took me yeah. out of band and orchestra and I wasn't allowed to play. And I would go to practice every day and he'd say, only do long tones. And I would cry because I sounded so bad. My lips would shake. I want to I want to chime in on two things that you said. One of them is I also went through a traumatic uh, embouchure adjustment with him that was fabulous, and I just remember with my head joint only, right? Yeah. In front of the mirror because I had one of those really really tight, and it was just really amazing. And the other thing I want to say is, and maybe you're aware of this, Dion, but so many people in this like younger generation don't know who Peter Lloyd is. Did you oh, know no. that? That's so sad because he's really a great great man. He studied in Paris, you know, with Carge, who was one of the original professors at the French of the French flute school. He huge. And that's where Peter Lloyd studied. And that's why he said, you know, you, and I think he told both of us, you've got to get out of the United States. Like we live in a little bit in a bubble here and having him being from Europe, he understood that. And, and he really said, you know, you've got to go and hear other musicians and other cultures and you have to learn another language. And all of this is going to make you a better musician. And at the time I remember thinking like, well, why is it so important? I mean, I went to Interlock and I went to Interlock and Arts Academy, you know, why do I need to leave the country? But honestly, um, as you'll hear from both of us, it changed our lives, it changed our perspective, it gave us things to think about. When you learn a different language, you learn how to think about color and how you make sounds and the sound cavity and, and how you create different sounds. And that all plays into the kind of colors you can get on your instruments and musically how you phrase things. and. In Paris, I, did a, I spent a lot of time studying impressionistic art and the artists, and I went to all these museums. And that's how I sort of fell in love with the whole French music thing. And that's why, you know, I recently did the CD. I made a CD of all French music so that I'd have a record of kind of what those skills were that I learned over there. And I didn't want that to get lost. So, um, so yeah, but so yeah, so we studied with Peter Lloyd for four years and he had so many successful students. I mean, a lot of us, you know, have big jobs and are working all over the country and the world. And um, he's a wonderful man. So he encouraged me to go study in Paris and with Alain Marion because uh, he was the professor at the Paris Conservatory at the time. And he kept saying to me, don't, you know, on the Fulbright, you can study, you can have lessons. You don't have to get into the Paris Conservatory. And uh, you can just go have lessons with him. And so I thought, well, but he said, you might as well try. And so I thought, okay, I'll try. And I remember showing up to the audition and there were like 300 French flutists there from all over the world. And they were like playing things 10 times faster than I had practiced them. And I was getting all freaked out in my head. I thought, oh my gosh, I've never heard flutists like this in my life. I'm just I'm gonna embarrass myself. And um, I was so nervous. And I walk into the audition room and I could see like, Marion was at the back of the hall and Jean-Pierre and Paul was there because Jean-Pierre and Paul was Marion's teacher at the Conservatoire. So he was on the committee and they asked me to do something in French and I didn't understand what they said. So I started playing the, uh, <laughs> the Gobert, the Tafno and Gobert and what they had asked for was the Reinke Concerto. <laughs> so I thought when I came out of the room, my pianist who was Japanese, he said, oh, you played the wrong piece. And so I went home. I figured I didn't have to wait to see the results. And they called me and they're like, you need to come back to play round two. And I was shocked. And then I went back and there were three more rounds. Anyway, um, of the 200 people, there were three of us accepted into his class. It was myself, uh, a girl from Belgium and a guy from Switzerland. And there were only 12 of us in the class. And out of the 12, I think only four or five were actually French. We were from all over the world. So it was really an international class and I got to meet people. 
from all over the world. And I'll never forget, <laughs> all the lessons are, you know, open, right? So I don't know if it was like that in Germany, but there's no private lessons. So once I was inside the conservatory, all of our lessons were in front of the 12 kids in the class. And so every lesson was a performance. There was just so much pressure. And these French kids, their technique and their solfege, they've been singing solfege since they were toddlers. And remember how at IU we learned one, two, three, four, five? I was yes, I do lost, totally lost. And it turns out that my solfege professor was a student of Mestian. She's an organist and she studied with Mestian. So there were just all these amazing like historical figures in this school that I'm learning from. And I was just terrified. I think I spent the first six months completely terrified. And I was just trying to keep up and I didn't know if I was going to make it through and it was rough. I'm not going to lie. But after six months, I learned the language. I studied really hard and then, you know, I was there for a couple of years. So things came together in the end, but nobody thought I was going to get my first prize. They were like, oh, that American, she's never going to make it. Uh, and it turned out that I was lucky I did in the end. But I don't know if I ever told you this, Nina, but I had a complete mental breakdown, like right before the prize, because there was so much pressure around this thing. And I completely, technique was so emphasized, like if the notes weren't perfect. And you know how Peter Lloyd taught us, oh, just play the music. Nobody cares if you miss a note, be musical. It's all about the phrase. Yeah, just, just change the color, think blue. Yeah, it was all this esoteric, but in France, I mean, the notes, the technique was mind boggling that I heard around me. So I became hyper focused on practicing technical exercises. And I was so freaked out about that, that I lost my sound for about six months. My sound just like went away. I think I was so stressed out. And I called Peter Lloyd, who was in London again, thankfully. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to pass my prize in four months. I just got the repertoire and I cannot play. I became so obsessed with the perfect technique that, and he said, oh, fly to London. I pick you up from the airport and I'm gonna bring you to my house and I fix everything. I'm like, I don't know if you can fix this in one day. This has been going on for like six months. And he's like, just come, just come. So I did, I flew to London. And he worked with me for six hours without a break. I'm not kidding. On sound and long tones. And that was it. And I left his house and I had my sound back. And then I went to win the prize like two months later. So, it, you know, for any of you that feel like you're struggling or you get discouraged, take it from me. I've had every obstacle thrown at me under the sun and you can still do it. Like there's a way, if there's a will, there's a way. You just have to find the right people to help you, the right teachers to encourage you, you know, take advantage of the people that you think can help you and make sure you contact them and ask them for help. Because if I had never asked him for that, that lesson, I don't think I would, I wouldn't be where I am today for sure. Yeah. And another thing that you said, and I guess we're kind of already doing the conversation, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> we're going organic here, which is great. Um, you know, when I, when I auditioned in Germany for my Zen, they were like, I think, oh. 200 flute players auditioning for two slots wow yeah. you know and the whole thing about like um you know stages of the audition like we don't really have that here we have a preliminary and a you know like maybe there's like recordings that you send in for screen pre-screen but over there you're walking into these big old beautiful buildings where like in my case it was literally hitler's headquarters Oh so like the music school was where, you know, you see all those like um, those videos of Hitler standing on this like balcony and with his hand out. I, I literally practiced in that room almost every day. Oh and, God. you know, the walls are wooden and you've got this history and you've got like these teachers who have are legacies. You know, Meisen was like a legacy. Again, most people in the United States, who's Meisen? Who's Peter Lloyd? But, you know. And make sure and, every single one of your students listens to his recording of the A minor, the Sonata. I will never forget hearing that for the first time. And I only listened to it because I think it was after I found out that you were going to study with him and I was blown away by how beautiful his musicianship is. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, but the, yeah, so you, you show up and you're in the studio and suddenly your studio classes, which in your case were, was every lesson, they're loaded with like amazing flute players. And every time you hear somebody get up, you're like, <laughs> you're blown away and you're, and you're inspired by each other. And we have that here. We, our studio classes are so inspiring. Um, and the thing is you have to be able to maintain a belief in your path, you know, because if, if you are comparing yourself to how somebody else plays, or if you're, you, you just can't get through it. You're gonna have a mental breakdown. You're gonna be 
in the wrong space. You have to believe there's a space for you on this planet as a flutist, if that's what your heart is calling you to, or a teacher or whatever. Um, and you, it's really hard though, in certain environments to kind of be like, where is my voice? You know, and in your case, you lost your voice a little bit because of it, you know, mm -hmm. but that's, that's challenging. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Like being surrounded by people who are just like so amazing and wondering how you fit in a little bit? Yeah. So one of the kids in my class, if you can look him up online, he's a famous soloist now in France. His name's Alex e. Kosinko. At the time he was 16. I, there's a, you, to get into the Paris Conservatory, the deadline was September 29th of when you were 21 years old. And my birthday was September 25th. So I squeezed in by four days, making, being able to make it into the conservatory. So I was one of the older kids and I already had four years with Peter Lloyd. This kid, Alex e. Kosinko was 16 years old and I'll never forget, it was like the second or third class of the year. And he comes up and he's like, oh, I didn't practice this week. What should I play? And as a joke, I said, oh, why don't you play the Jolie Bay Concerto? Like I was literally kidding. <laughs> and he came in an hour later and just nailed it to the wall. Like, my jaw was on the floor. He was 16 years old, a complete prodigy. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like, I think I had to practice that for like a year before I could play it. And this guy just, this kid came in and it was just awesome. And the reason that I became so obsessed with the notes was because they didn't forgive. I don't know if it's like this in Germany, but in France, it's very much like technical perfection is just a given. Um, there wasn't any any kind of camaraderie like we had in Peter Lloyd's studio where we support each other. It was like, if you miss a note, it was like a serious thing and people would be talking about it. So it just, it became kind of like, uh, I was so afraid of missing a note that I just let everything else go. Sound and musicianship, I was so focused on not missing a note. And we also had five hours of technique classes every Saturday with Raymond Guillaume, who was his his assistant, and he actually studied with Taffanel and Gobert, and he was like old school French technique. So he would, we would get into this class and we'd stand in a circle and he'd make up exercises and he'd change keys, he'd change articulation, he would change rhythm, and he would point at you and you had to go and you were pointed at. And it moved very quickly. And if anyone made a mistake, he'd make you do it over and over until it was perfect. And at the time, it was really hard for me because I felt like once I made a mistake, it tended to happen more and more. Like at the time I wasn't mentally aware, like I am now of how to kind of get over those obstacles. But um, after two years, I finally got it. But I remember, uh, I don't know if you've ever played the, uh, um, the De Lorenzo etudes, the really long, the 15th yeah. classic etudes. So in addition to the five hours of technique, he would assign an etude every week and you had to come and perform that etude in front of the class. Yeah. And there are many pages long and they're very difficult. And I remember there was one time I was on like page five and it was going great. And I missed a note in the like second to last bar and he stopped and he said, like, go back to the beginning, do it again. You know, and every time I would make a mistake, he would tell you how to fix it, which was the good thing. You'd work on it for a few minutes, but then he'd make you go back to the beginning and perform the entire thing flawless again. And you couldn't sit down till you did it. So if you took too long, the other students were getting really upset because first of all, they're sitting there waiting for you to get it right. And second of all, we weren't allowed to leave class till everyone's etude was perfect. So there were days we were there all day on Saturday and we wouldn't get out till six or seven dinner time. We got there at nine in the morning. So it was intense, very, very <laughs> intense. So what do you think about that? Like what are the benefits of that and what are the not benefits of that? Well, I think we could talk all day long about that because it turned out once I ended up at Juilliard for my master's degree with Julius Baker, um, I had met the performance psychologist Don Green at that point and he, I was able to take, he was giving a class at Julia about how to be mentally tough and I struggled my whole life with anxiety and auditions. I mean really, really bad anxiety like and so I had to coach with him for a couple of years to get my head back in the right space to get out of that mindset where every note had to be perfect and so much putting so much pressure on myself and perfectionism uh, i think that's an important thing to talk about as professors of music and teaching students who aspire to be professional musicians because perfectionism is not always it's not a good thing you know you have to understand music is about expressing yourself like you said it's about touching other people it's about making a statement and we can become so self-obsessed like I have to be perfect. I have to be this, I have to be that. No, it's like, 
you have to be more gentle with yourself. And it took me a lot of years to learn that, you know, I suffered a lot because I was expecting perfection all the time and it's not possible. And so you have to, you kind of have to learn to accept 90% of your best. That's how you win an audition, you know, or even 85% sometimes, but it's, you know, it's a struggle. And every day I had to learn how to take auditions. I had, I used to run stairs. Like I would run, I would get my practice room next to the stairway, run a load of stairs, come back up, and record myself the beginnings of each excerpt to make sure that when my heart was beating fast, I, I, you know, Don Green taught me take three breaths, learn how to calm your heart rate down and then start to play. So when you train yourself performing under the situation of anxiety every day, then that feels natural to you when you walk on stage. Whereas if you practice in your practice and it's perfect and that's all you do when you go on stage, all of a sudden you feel this pressure and your breath gets kind of airy or you're losing, you know, your heartbeat's going fast. You don't feel comfortable. So his psychological philosophy, because he trained Olympic athletes, was you have to be mentally tough. Like that's even more important than how you play the instrument. It's the people who can, who can play at their potential in a pressurized situation. It doesn't matter how good you are in the practice room. Nobody cares because no one's listening to you. It's the people that can show up on stage, play, play in a state of flow. I don't know if you've read that book by Mikhail Chikchik Tamali. Yeah. You heard of that book. It's a fantastic book. The greatest musicians who have figured out how to play in the state of flow. They're the ones that, that make it like, it's very, I think the key to flow and we, we have these, you might be interested in seeing um, this practice cover sheet. So the studio, um, the students create a week in advance practice training plan. And we also have an entire semester in advance so they all know what weeks they're coming in with what when their pianists are coming in and it's it's really more about um time management and also understanding how to break things down in macro and more micro kind of things and then there's flexibility last week or in our recent pod we talked about how, how that still needs to be flexible it's a template but we have this training plan cover sheet and on the front of it it's like you know, here, here are options of things to think about, but what are, what are your intentions is one of them. Like, what kind of an intention do you go into your practice space with? So regardless of whether your mindset is focused on being, you know, lock solid in technique, technique, which technique can be a lot of things, but we tend to think of it as, you know, this, um, you are there with an intention. And in that case, the intention might be to be quote unquote perfect. But when you move into other kinds of intention, like what kind of an energetic space are you creating for yourself? And I'm sure with your work with, um, was it Don Green? Yeah. Yeah. So you work with Don Green. It's, it's like, you know, you are going to be creating a space no matter what you're creating. What is that space? What is your focus? What is your intention? You know, and, um, and that can be to create a, a space of healing. And how do you even do that? Well, we're not taught how to do that. Has anyone ever, you know, gone to a class that talks about how to create a healing practice space? Or I know the word safe space is like a big buzzword these days, you know, like, are we creating safe spaces for ourselves in our practice? What are the voices to keep out? What are the voices to welcome in? We also have a little affirmation section, like what are your affirmations for the week? You know, and those are like kind of um, in some way there, I like to think of them as like um, brainwashing phrases, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but really like you're going to be talking to yourself anyway. I know I talk to myself all the time. So if you're going to be talking to yourself, you might as well be saying things that are like affirmative and, and you know, and realistic and positive. But yeah, that whole, that whole concept of, you know, like you will play perfect and you will play this A2 till you drop dead and everybody else drops dead and you will practice 10 hours a day and you will be at this 50 hour long masterclass. I'm not a fan. I assume you're no longer a fan, right? Well, I mean, I, I took, there were things about it that actually helped me to be really successful later in my career. For example, because of the pressure he put on us and because everything was on the spot the sight reading skills, like I've been called twice to sight, to play on less than 24 hours notice, the alto flute solo in Daphne and Chloe with the Chicago symphony, one day notice to play second flute with the Boston symphony. I can do that. And I can do that because he was the way he was with us. It's a very different school. It's a very different technique of training, 
Luckily, I've been able to assimilate all the good things from the French flute school and also come back to myself with what you're talking about and having to relearn my brain, positive self-talk, positive keywords for each excerpt I'm about to play. So I put my mind in a creative space that's not critical. Because one thing I figured out for myself is when you're practicing, you do have to be critical because you, look, let's face it, there's a, so many qualified flutists and there's not that many jobs. So for you to stand out in that audition, and I've been on the both sides of being on the committee of an audition at Lyric Opera, and then also taking so many auditions over the course of my career. And I can tell you that to get past the first round, everyone is gonna play with a beautiful sound, have great technique, have a musical idea in their head that they're going to express, great intonation and a beautiful sound. Like that's a given. So what are you gonna do in that audition that's gonna set you apart from the hundreds of other people that can already do what's already difficult? Like that's the baseline. So in order to set yourself apart, you have to have your own creative ideas of what you wanna express because really from being on the other side of auditions, what really touches you as, a, as, a, as an audition committee member is the person that jumps out from behind the screen and speaks to your heart the one that you feel their connection to the music, you feel their commitment to the idea. It's not just about playing loud and perfect technique and big notes. No, it's the person that really captures the spirit of what the composer wanted. And there have been so many times where of all the hundreds of people we've listened to, there were maybe one or two from the first round, I could tell these are the people that have that. And I, I'll talk about that a little bit today when we get to the excerpts, like in Semiramide, uh, there are so many pitfalls musically that I've heard so many kids do over and over and over, and also with my own students, preparing them for auditions. And just, um, I want to talk about, you know, those, those details, because with my students, I'm super encouraging, I'm super supportive, but I'm also, especially with, like today, we're on a time thing. I'm also very much like, if they're coming to me for advice on auditions, and I've been practicing these excerpts for now 25, 30 years, I have so much I want to impart that I just, I can be very quick and very, I speak quickly, but it's only because I want them to take as much as they can so they can be their best. So um, do you want to go into the playing the excerpts or do you want to continue uh, talking? About <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, let's do that. Dustin, I just had somebody who asked me if they could join and I'm having problems finding the link for, for the Zoom room. <laughs> could you um, email me or could, would you be able to message the Zoom link on Messenger or um, it's Patricia Nagel, by the way, Dion, do you know Patricia? Yeah, yeah she's trying to join. She's also um, one of the flutists that she's going to be on one of our guest artists. Oh, fantastic. She's one of the flutists who's American who ended up in Paris also. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So is it possible to messenger a link, Dustin, or does it have to go through email or? Um, you mean, uh, did, she, did she ask your profile or the WVU? Like she, she messaged me directly. But okay, are you I'll just, I don't think I have her, but here, I'll send it to you and then you can just copy paste it to her. Could you send it? Um, Does that work? Oh, I see. So I can just forward it to her now, right? Okay, yeah, sorry. You... One second. Um, good. Okay, great. I think it went through. Thanks, Dustin. Dustin is our TA, Dion. Awesome. He's fabulous. I, we love the, him. We love you, Dustin. <laughs> okay, so what, um, so Dion's listened to both uh, links so far, and maybe what we'll do is, so we, we are, let's, let's kind of keep it short, because I think that the um, things that you have to say are, are more important than just the flute, the piccolo uh -huh. excerpt. But let's give, uh, we're at 31, let's do 12 minutes, her is that enough do you think oh sure. yeah okay and um i guess i'll be the timekeeper for that so i'll give you the heads up um do we want to listen to part of these first uh or do you want to just that's up to you if you're if you want your students to have the experience of performing like in front of their classmates that's fine but i already listened to the recordings many times so uh okay. it's whatever whatever's best for the students I'm yeah let me let me play it uh let me play them the recordings okay so I should be sharing my screen, hopefully. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Thank you, Dustin. All right, so uh, what, would you, what would you like to do first, Dion? Uh, let's start with the, the Rossini. Okay.
Uh, Jacob, what was that trick you showed me last time where we don't hear the room, but we, ha we hear the recording? I can't hear you. Um, it's on the top bar. And this then there's bar. Options. The top one, all the way up, this. where like you have the green for the share screen. Yeah, it's disappeared. I don't know where the bar went. I have too many pay things open here. So how do I find the bar? Woo! Whoa, where'd everyone go? Down here, maybe? Okay, we'll try, we'll try it like this. And if you cannot hear, I'll have one of you guys let me know and I'll try the Jacob way. Okay, here we go. I'm a sophomore for the performance major here at WVU, and today I'll first be playing. How does that work? Can we hear that? Yep. Okay. Rossini's Overture to Simonami Day. There are three piccolo excerpts that I'll be playing, and then I'll be playing the fiber. Is that a good place to stop, Dion? At least yes. we have a little bit of an idea and you can go into speaking. Yes, that's okay, perfect. So let, me, um, let me unscreen share. Can I, speak, like, can I ask Nathan questions or can he talk? Yeah. Okay, Nathan great. Is, was right there. Ethan, I'm sorry, Ethan, go ahead, Ethan, and unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. Okay. So first of all, I just want to say, you know, fantastic playing. It's so clean and you've got a really beautiful piccolo sound. And by the way, I have to say, you know, the one thing about playing piccolo is they really want someone with a very sweet sound. Because as we all know, the piccolo and forte can be very harsh and can be very kind of strident. And to get a job in an orchestra, trust me, every person on the committee, the biggest thing they're listening for is can I sit next to this piccolo player and and you know not have my ears be like blown out because a sweet beautiful sound on the piccolo is so hard to do and you have it it's really you have a very sweet sound like I would love to sit next to you and hear that that's how good it was um but I'm here to help you try to get a job so now I have to tell you the things we can kind of work on okay so I'm just curious and the, the one thing about piccolo that took that I have really studied is like our alternative fingerings um, and in this excerpt, especially for the high D, and when we get to the uh, Vivaldi for the like C sharp, I'm just curious, um, do you know the fingering for the high D, the, the trick fingering? Because from A to D as a fourth, the D tends to be what, sharp or flat on the piccolo, do you know? Flat. Exactly. It makes it flat. It's very flat, okay? So especially when you're coming from the A, and we need to make a diminuendo up to the D because it's like an appoggiatura, right? So we need the ending of that D to be not only perfectly in tune, but also to have a very, the ending has to sound like the note's gonna continue going out into the hall and it has to end with beauty. It can't just be cut off, okay? You can't just clip it off. That doesn't sound elegant and musical. And Rossini's fun and light, so we don't want anything to sound heavy, right? Um, right. I love the way you're articulating your first F sharp, by the way. And what's your tempo? What's the about, about 150? 150. Okay, great. Anything between 144 and 152 is a winning tempo for an audition. Okay. One thing I noticed in your recording was the way you took your breath before you started to play. Um, I really think that breath should be in time because to be really solid, 
playing the repeated F sharp for three beats. I've heard so many candidates start this excerpt and then they speed up on the second beat. You didn't do that, so that's fantastic. However, I really think that like it, you have to be very, very solid with the tempo before you start to play. And I sort of saw you, you kind of took like a, a breath and I kind of want to see and also for the first F sharp, do you use your pinky or not? I don't. I have been using my pinky. Try it without the pinky. It's a little bit clearer. The first note comes out with a better attack. And also try to make sure that those F sharps, you want to lead. All these first three beats are leading you to what's important part of the phrase, which is the A to the D, right? Mm -hmm. So don't play, which is nothing wrong with that, but you want to play. And then the D has to sound very, very beautiful. Um, don't accent it. So. The trick finger for the D, which is it's sharper, so you can really play the A forte and then it's gonna sound like a diminuendo when you play this. I'm just gonna give it to you. you. Don't You can try it if you want, but right now it's the thumb, two, three, the A flat key, and then, yeah. So, so here it is without the trick fingering. And here, if you see if you can hear the difference. Like a little bit flat, can you hear that? But with the new fingering, it's it's softer and I can make a diminuendo. So it's thumb, two, three, A flat key, your F key, and your pinky. That's it. Okay. It's a little awkward. So make sure you practice it with a tuner. Make sure that is a perfect fourth. It's super in tune and get used to that fingering. It's not something you want to do. If you have an audition tomorrow, forget it. Don't do it. It really it needs time for you to really get used to that fingering. But it's so beautiful when it's done right. And I really believe in that fingering for the high D. So I want you to think about that. Now, your A to your D now is going to be beautiful. You're going to go to the A. You're going to make a great diminuendo to the D. But now when you have the second phrase starting on the D, are D's on piccolo? What, what's their tendency? Middle D. Middle D on piccolo, what's its pitch tendency? Oh, mine, mine is uh, flat again. Really? Most middle yeah. D's are very sharp. So you really is. And I'm playing a Keith piccolo. What kind of piccolo do you have? This is a Brandon, but it's not actually my piccolo. Okay. So, well, that's, e that's even more amazing because the one thing about being a piccolo player and winning a job on piccolo is you need to spend so much time practicing half steps, whole steps, fifths, and octaves. You need to know where every interval is in tune because when you're in an orchestra, I mean, I think one of the times I sight read was to play for John Williams with the Boston Symphony, um, the whole Star Wars stuff. And I, I was called at the last minute and it's just the one thing about being a great piccolo player is you have to know that you're in tune and you have to be very confident that you've done the work to know where all of your innovers are because if something's out of tune in a chord guess who sounds wrong it's always the piccolo player that gets blamed from the conductor always every single time so make sure that your intervals are in tune now when you went for the second phrase with the d the d needs to be lipped down just a little bit and then i want to hear you play the beautiful e with a lot of vibrato but then release the a do the op, you know, do the same thing you did from the A to the D, but now you're going from the E to the A. It's, it still has to be the exact same inflection. Those two phrases have to match. Does that make sense? So yeah. can you just try those first, the first four bars for me again, please? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Also for the low A, try using the G sharp key. It just kind of raises it a little bit and gives you that same kind of finesse that you get on the high D. The okay. first attack wasn't clear. What can we do to fix that? That's so important on piccolo that the very first attack. Can you try that? Just try it one more time. That was great. Okay, keep going this time. Sorry. So yeah, just practice on your own. Go from the A, D, then E, then do the E to the A and make sure you can record yourself and make sure the inflection is the same and that it's a beautiful release on both of those notes. That's really important. Now the next time, the third time this comes around, what's different about this phrase? How does it change? Um, instead of doing like resolving yeah. to the, how it resolved before it goes it resolves a different way, I guess. Exactly. It continues, right? He writes a crescendo, and then you're going to go into these 16th notes. 
Now, I want you to be very careful because on your recording, and I've done this in auditions too, you need to wait after you play the G, make sure the space between the G and the 3 16th pickups is absolutely precise. We, sometimes we tend to jump the gun because we know what's coming up. It's hard. So make sure that that space is exactly the same because the committee is really listening for that. Okay. Don't clip off either. And you know, see how there's the accent and the appoggiatura has to be the right weight, be lighter on the resolute note. And then those three pickups should be very clean, very short and very articulated each time. Okay. So we're officially sadly out of time. Are you serious? <laughs> Yeah, but I actually, I interrupted you trying to get your attention and I, oh, actually I'm sorry. Missed, I missed your pearls of wisdom. Oh, could you re say what you just said? And then Ethan, you go ahead and try it and then we'll go on to Lydia. Can I just give him a few more points, like 30 seconds more of what I heard in the other two things that he played just because yeah. I feel And then you can also email those to me and I think we need to have Dion back. What do you all think? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be happy to email you more comments, but I just, one really important thing on the second excerpt, Ethan, um, can he just play like the first three, or just play it really quick for us so we can hear? So I hear, da-da-da-dum, 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 that's not the right inflection, right? So it's da-da-da-dum. Da 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 right? So everything that you play, I want, you need to really show me that you have a very good conviction of where this phrase is going. So, and please don't accent. Uh, one, one of my huge pet peeves is the Pagiaturas. And whether you're playing Mozart, Rossini, or Stravinsky, Firebird, the Pagiaturas always have to be weighted. You know, the Pagiaturas have to be weighted and the release has to be has to be lighter. Never play two apogee notes with the same weight, okay? And Raymond Guillaume in Paris drilled this into our heads until we were blue in the face with that, uh, the Moise interpretation book. He made us play these slow melodies and all he talked about was how to play an apogeatura. So that is a basic musical condition that you need to show the committee that you understand. What notes get weight? What note is the release? Never play an appoggiatura the same way. And that's all over this excerpt. So I noticed it in the, ex in the second excerpt. And then the same thing in the third excerpt, the, when you have the, can you just play the third excerpt really quick too? Hmm? Okay, super fabulous last three bars. That was so, so clean. I love how you went up to the high A. That was really fantastic. I have played this for many conductors and e every time they want those Ds short. You're playing it very legato. You're like, and then again, you're doing the same thing where you're going instead of so just think about that a little bit more in this excerpt because your playing is so clean and it's so, it's, it's fantastic, but these details need a little more work, okay? Make sure the accented notes have the right weight. Make sure the appoggiaturas have a release on them. Make sure your phrase is always going somewhere. Rossini is always going somewhere in the phrase and especially with repeated notes. Never play like three beats of repeated notes the same. Always have direction with those notes, okay? Okay. All right, really, really quick. I know we don't have time to talk about it, but your Stravinsky, Ba -ba -da -dum, ba -ba -da -dum. you're putting a huge accent on the high D sharp. And that's a very dangerous thing to do in audition because there might be a tuba player behind the screen who doesn't know the rhythm. And you have to be very careful when you're playing this excerpt. Bum -ba -da -dum, bum -ba -da -dum. Show where the beat is. That was the biggest thing I heard in your excerpt. It's very clean technically, but the beat was, um, thinking of French, I'm saying décalé, which means your beat got kind of turned upside down. So just make sure, just because it's the highest note doesn't mean it should have an accent. You know, the, make sure your beats, you know, one and three are, are really clear and really clean, okay? Okay. All right, I wish I could work with you more on this. I, you know, like I said, I've spent years and years practicing these excerpts. So I wish we had more time, but fantastic job. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great, so um, now I'm gonna share screen again and find Lydia here somewhere. Ah, where did my email go? Oh my goodness, this is complicated. I know, I don't know how you're doing. <laughs> I don't know how I'm doing it e either. 
Um, all right, Lydia. Hello, my name is Lydia Monson, and today I'll be performing the second movement from the Vivaldi Piccolo Concerto in C major. I hope you enjoy. Bravo, Lydia. So you can you can uh, unmute yourself and is um if anyone needs to leave, obviously you need you go. Okay, I have a feeling we might run slightly over, which I'm excited about personally. <laughs> um, so welcome to stay. Welcome to go. Okay. So is everyone? Can you hear me? Okay, because my sound was cutting out a little bit during her recording. I can hear you. Okay, great. So um, beautiful, Lydia, really fantastic. So expressive, I, lo I love, I really love that. Um, your phrasing is just, it's beautiful. So, um, and your pitch is fantastic too. So all of those things are really well in place. One thing I wanted to ask you about was your tempo. Um, I think it could just be a hair too faster. I personally really like this at eighth note equals 72. Um, you wanna think of it in two, but you still wanna have you still need to feel the internal beat so it doesn't slow down. When you were adding your ornaments, sometimes it got a little bit uh, behind, like just it started to drag a little bit because you were being so beautifully expressive, which I love, but just make sure that you keep 
the tempo has to be steady, okay? Don't slow down so much just because you're adding ornaments. I also wanted to ask you for high, for your middle B, do you have, the, do you know the alternate fingering? Where is Lydia? Is she, I can't see her. Um, is she here? So I'm here. She, okay, there you are. Deanna, are you able to see her? Because there's a way to drag like the- Now I see her. I see her now. I didn't see her before. So um, again, with piccolo playing, intervals have got to be absolutely perfectly in tune, especially for the beginning of this movement. This will usually on a piccolo audition be the first excerpt you will be asked to play in all the rounds. And so really they're listening for the fifth between the E and the B. Now I have an alternate fingering for the B, which I think uh, really works. It, it comes out, it's kind of like the D I was telling um, Ethan in the previous lesson, but for high B, you can also use one, two, three, one, two, three in both hands, no thumb and no G sharp key. So the okay. difference being if I play it with a regular fingering, or this is the trick, the alternate fingering. It's just a little bit um, gentler and it doesn't, it, it's just easier to get around with the, with the, um, with the musicality of how that, you don't want that B again, you don't want an accent on it. You want to sort of play a diminuendo through beats one and beat two. So the B has to be very gentle and very, like a lot of finesse on it. So I would really suggest you try that fingering, okay? And also, oh, thank you. Um, uh, your pickup notes from the B to the E in bar one, two, in, in the third bar, make sure that your pickup, the high E, should sound like it's just floating out, okay? So make sure the B has a lighter articulation and it sounds like a pickup into the E, okay? Don't let there be any kind of break or space. Keep the phrase moving. The other thing is your breath is a little bit too long. Um, in general, there are many times where I wrote that down in my notes. Your breath, um, I want you to take, take the time of the breath from the E. Don't hold the E its full length and then be late on the B. Do you see what I'm saying? Try to make your breath just a little bit quicker and try to hide them so that they don't inter interrupt the phrase. That's really important on piccolo, especially because when we're nervous on piccolo, that's the one thing we feel like we need these enormous breaths, but we actually don't. You can get, you know what I mean? It takes less airstream to, to play a beautiful phrase. So I want you to try that pick up into the high E and make the high E just float out. Now, I love the way you're uh, phrasing through the, the bar four, the A sharps, but your run, your run, it was so sad because your whole, the whole first like five bars were so fantastic and so beautiful. And then there was like a little bit of a, something happened on the run where it wasn't, I didn't hear every note in its place. And I want the run to lean me up to that high E. So I want you to think it's, I know it's a group of 10, but I want you to think one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one. So it sort of has the momentum. I want you to break it up into a group, two groups of five. So. So it sort of has like, it's bringing you up to that E and make sure every note is very clean and crystal clear. Can you just try that for me? One, On that two, one, two, four. yeah. And think of okay. it in groups of five. Good, much better. And you can even put a little bit of a breath accent on the G sharp. So, cause that's your second group of five. Cause you have and then move through after you kind of rest just for a split second. I mean, you're not holding it, but just use it so that within the notes, every note is crystal clear and every note is in its proper place. Don't rush through it, take your time, but make sure it's clean, okay? Because on the recording, it wasn't, it wasn't super clean. Now, for the last two bars, what's the most difficult part of the last bar of this, of this section, do you think? Um, for me, it's the E, the very last note. The, very, the B, right? Okay, so I'm, I have a perfect solution for that for you. Also, do you know the trick fingering for the C sharp? Because this is important too. C sharp tends to be flat just like the D. So um, many times I use this fingering all the time. So it's two, three, uh, two, three pinky for the C sharp. So listen to the difference. Here's the regular C sharp. You hear how much higher it is? So especially yeah. when you're coming from above and you have The 
that last B, use this trick fingering. Write it down and don't forget it because it's very easy to make a diminuendo and you can hold it longer. And it just has a, it has a better color for the end of this phrase. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And make sure those half steps, the half steps and the whole steps in those last two bars, once you hit the E, the C sharp to the B, be very careful. Your whole step was not exactly, it was a little bit higher than a whole step. So make sure your intonation on the C sharp to the B and then the B to the A sharp, and then the half step between the A sharp to the last note it has to be really, really true, okay? So please practice always with the tuner on this because this is the first thing they're gonna hear and the intonation has to be spectacular, okay? Um, I have a question. Will you send our lovely, wonderful WVU Flute Studio a list of your... <laughs> Oh my gosh. Of your wonderful trick fingering so that we can all, you sure. know. Yes, absolutely. Not a problem. Um, okay, so how much more can we keep going? Well, um, how about we go till four on Lydia and then we talk for another five minutes because I really did want to talk a little bit about yeah, sure. studying abroad. Yeah. So Lydia, do you want to, can you play the second time now with your ornaments for us? We'll just work on the first half with your ornaments. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm just going to try that B fingering first. Yeah. There it is. That's beautiful. Good. Okay, good. I know it's it's very hard to try to remember these fingerings on the spot, so don't worry at all. But I loved um, that was really beautiful, and the run was much better. The one the run was much better. I just want to hear you play just the last. I just want you to practice once the last, the very last interval from. So make sure that the A sharp has a lot of vibrato, and then practice it with the new fingering. Okay. That feel isn't it easier to let go of the note yeah it's so much easier it's so Thank much better so. it's such a big such a big difference and also play around with the c sharp in the last bar too because playing with the fingering i gave you the c sharp to the b is much more in tune um the other thing i just wanted to say is i really think you took a breath some of your breaths i don't think you need um i really think you can go you took a breath after the second d sharp in bar two can you finish that phrase? Can you do that whole phrase in one breath? Do you need that yeah. breath, really? Yeah. I think you can do it. Um, because generally, really, you can only breathe twice <laughs> in this, you know? So, um, and that, again, I think if you pick up the tempo, just a teeny bit, have a little more direction, a little more forward flowing. Don't get so bogged down. I love your expressiveness. Don't change this. Just do it in tempo, okay? It's very okay. beautiful. Very beautiful. Yeah. Do you have any other questions for me about it? Anything you want to ask? I don't think so. Thank okay. you so much. Good. Yeah. Um, wait, sorry. One thing I just thought about. Before the pickup B to the E in bar three, you need to play the E just a split second shorter so that your pickup is exactly on time. You're a little late on that still. Make that breath really quick. Okay? All right. Great job. Okay. I wish you. we had more time. You. <laughs> I know. It's, it's torture. So Dion, do you have more time? Do you have like 10 more minutes? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Wow, yeah. what a good. 
Um, so I want everyone to just think about a question if you haven't already um, and kind of jot that down because we're going to take questions soon. Um, but I wanted to get back to the international study abroad topic because we have people in our studio who already know that they're interested in doing that. Right. And we have those who don't know that they are, but they're going to find out that they are, <laughs> right? So I love being on computer because you can do things like this with your eyeball. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, I think we should both just speak for maybe a moment about the impact. You already started a little bit of um, study abroad and just like a little phrase or two from each of us. And then, and then also talk about what we think that we did well in order to get the Fulbright, which for those of you who may not know, like is one of the hardest, most amazing things to get. Um, and I'll preface that by saying, basically you win this award, you have to apply a year in advance and they pay your flight, they, they pay all of your schooling, then they throw money at you every month while you're in Europe. <laughs> and then you can do all these other things. Like if you decide to take a train to go to like, I don't know, Belgium or something, they'll, you know, you can apply for other things. And then while you're there, they have these great meetings and you can perform. And, and there are many other kinds of grants like the, um, the Rotary Foundation grant is huge. It's a wonderful grant. So these things exist and many of us have had these discussions. You don't just decide you're gonna get them the year before you get them, unless you're Dion, who made who made that decision. Um, you know, in my case, I was 14, and like my whole like life to that point was like, how can I build up my resume and get a Fulbright? Um, so I think we should talk a little bit about the impact and the benefits of study abroad and what we feel like we did that put us in a position to actually win such a hard grant. So I'm going to have you go first with that, Dion. Okay. Well, first of all like Nina said, this application, I mean, I may have decided later than you to apply for Fulbright, but I spent an entire year doing research on why I had to go to the French flute school. Why was that the only country that I needed a Fulbright to? Like I had of a reason. I mean, if their government is, your government's going to pay to send you to a country, they want to know that that is the only place you can go. And I had to have a really solid concrete, you know, reason of why what I needed to learn to make myself a better musician was in France. So I did a ton of research. I was in the library hours and hours every day, getting every, my hands on every book about the Paris Conservatory and the history of the flutists that went there and the history of the professors that taught there. And I wrote an entire essay about that. And once I had that with the Fulbright, I think we had to have, you had to have your curriculum vitae, right? So it had to fit in one page, by the way. So it had to fit in this box. Yeah. And in those days, we didn't have, you know, everything you guys have now with computers. I was like on the first Mac, the original Mac, trying to figure out how to format this well, thing. I was, I was just laughing because you, you used the word book. Like, did you oh, notice? Yeah. She was like, I had to go to the library and get all the books. <laughs> how like, old we are. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I remember the days when you actually had to go get books. Yeah. And we had to look up in the card catalog, the number. Oh my gosh. It was awful. It was pretty bad. So, so after doing all that research, then I only had one page to write my, um, my curriculum vita and what did they call it? The page that was your... They call, yeah, they called it the abstract, the, the horrifying the word, the abstract. I'm still traumatized by that word. Oh my gosh, I'm traumatized too because after all the research, I had so much information, I didn't know how to put it on one page. And to get a Fulbright grant, you know, we're comp you're competing against not just musicians, you're competing against physicists and scientists and doctors and medical professionals, and they only give so many grants to each country. So uh, it really had to be a compelling argument as to why they should support you and give you all this money to go there. So. I decided to take the route of the impressionistic paintings that by by studying the work of like uh, Monet and Manet and all these impressionist painters that that was going to influence the way I played the music and that could only be done in France because the great museums that hold these paintings are there. So um, I used that and I also hired uh, I had an English like an English tutor who I hired to help me edit the essay because it was very hard to cut down 
every word had to have meaning because we just had a very small space to describe a really a project that was going to take us a year. So I got, I had help and I had someone, you know, helping me kind of make sure that it was very clear. And I reread and edited this one page for probably nine months before it was ready to submit. And then I also like with the curriculum vitae, I sort of had to like put some of the information in the CV because I couldn't fit it all in the abstract. And anyway, um, and then the recording, I mean, the recording was just insane. I had, I hired someone at IU, the recording engineer there. And in those days it was, it wasn't even on a DAT tape. It was on like a reel to reel tape, my original recording that had to be, you know, spliced and cut in a million different ways. And that took months to do. So once I got through that round, then they actually have, do you remember your interview? I had to go to an interview in a room in the university with a whole table of people I didn't know. And they asked me questions. They want to make sure that if they're going to send you to represent the United States and France, they want to know that if a French person sits down next to you at a cafe, you can hold an intelligent conversation and you're going to give the right kind of, of image that they want of an American. So they asked me questions of what kind, what, what's the government like in France? Who's the president? What's the cabinet like? So I had to study their government and their political system so that I could talk about that in this interview. And then I remember uh, at the time, it was funny, my boyfriend at the time, who eventually became my husband, wrote, did a pretend interview with me and he wrote up all these questions. And it turned out that I think two of the questions that he came up with were actually on my interview. So there was a lot of preparation and how to speak clearly. I think I, I met with a speech teacher, my speech teacher to help me present, you know, to speak and complete sentences and try to sound intelligent and, and educated in what I was talking about. So yeah, yeah. so let me, let me jump in here just to explain something. So the way this grant works, and we have, by the way, this university, WVU has a whole Fulbright office. Wow. Are you serious? Yeah, like the school is, to, it's a research one institute. Like wow. they, they have people like on salary who are there to like, you know, navigate yeah. this. That's awesome. And yeah, it's pretty amazing. So I'm again, hoping to send everybody this vibe, you know, like try to get a Fulbright. But um, the, the, the thing is like, you have to be, you have to pass the university level before the university recommends you as who they want to have enter the pool of the Fulbrighters. I mean, it's a, it's a process. And like Dion said, it took, it took me a year too. I remember writing my, my first narrative was 21 pages long. <laughs> and I you took it to, my, down to one page, right? I took it to my German pr professor who was going to be my coach, my mentor. And I remember he had these glasses on <laughs> and the, the thing started with on the street sides of Munich on the cobblestones where once walked the great, you know, and it was like all this flowery stuff and he was reading it because we didn't have email back then. So I had to <laughs> hand it to him. He was reading it and just like trying not to laugh, you know? Uh, but yeah, that whittling down and, um, you know, Alyssa Schwartz, uh, one of the people who some of us know from our studio, she, we worked on her Fulbright grant for like five months. Wow. Boarding process, you know, so you have, you can't just be like, oh, I want to get a Fulbright. <laughs> you have to be like, oh, I need to get a Fulbright because, you know, it would be epic. And now what do I need to do to get there? And one of the things I wanted to emphasize is you can't start early enough in terms of building that resume. Mm -hmm. And we're talking like competitions. Um, not only that, but I literally was such a poser because I wanted it so badly. And that's a new word. We didn't have poser back in the 80s, <laughs> but <laughs> or 90s. <laughs> you know that word? <laughs> Don't you love that word? That's like my favorite word. Okay. So I knew because of the ambassadorial aspect of the Fulbright, right? That, the, you know, you're going to represent the United States. You're an ambassador. Um, and because of the whole well-roundedness, like two years before I applied, I started joining every club. I was like on the board of Amnesty International, which like I wasn't even a political right. person, but I was like, I was trying to kill it in every department. Mm -hmm. um, the competitions, the, uh, you know, it's not just this narrative. It's like, how do you 
create? How do you become the person, the poster child of the Fulbright? Well, and I also want to just say once, once I was in Paris on this Fulbright, the amount of opportunities that came to me because I was a Fulbright scholar, for example, the, I had to go to the French embassy and then all of a sudden they wanted to promote me in concerts all over France. And so the American Franco Commission, because they knew was a, I was a Fulbright sponsor, sponsor um, sponsored me and my pianist in concerts all over France. We went to Monte Carlo, we went to Nice, went to Bordeaux, we went to Avignon, we went, uh, we played in Paris. And then at the end of it, the United States Embassy called me and asked if I would play a recital at the United States Embassy as a Fulbright scholar. So they actually had asked, there was, there was, all of the Fulbright scholars that were in France at that time came together and we, if you're a musician, you played a concert, there was a physicist who gave a lecture, there was an organist who played his own piece and this was all presented um, you know, through the United States Embassy. So the opportunities and the experiences that you got, that I got to have because of the Fulbright. Yeah, um, and not I, only that, but like in Europe in general, there's so much classical music that if you are a classical musician in Paris or in Munich or, you know, it like the, it breathe, they breathe, eat, breathe, you know, it's classical. You're, you're considered like a rock star. They respect artists so much. I mean, yeah. And if you're a student, they want to support you. And so, yeah. you know, there are all these opportunities that don't exist here, even in big cities here to get into these niches because there are also so many concert venues every church every capella every like little structure that could potentially hold two musicians there's a concert series and all you need is a harpist or just your flute and, and you can't get in for example i remember one of the first concerts they do lunchtime concerts so when people take their lunch break they go instead of eating lunch they want to come hear you play i used to give concerts all over paris and notre dame and these churches for lunch concerts and not only would it be full, but people would be standing outside to get in. That's how much they love and appreciate music and they wanna hear you play. And that's one thing about this country that I just still can't quite wrap my head around. It's like, we don't have the same appreciation for great art in that way that, you know, people that aren't musicians would give up their lunch hour to come hear beautiful music. And in Europe, it's in their culture, it's in their blood. And I just think it's so important, take advantage of these opportunities that are out there for you because it changed my life, it changed Nina's life. It's, it's you've got to take advantage of it because it's just the most amazing thing in the world. The people I met, the professors that I studied with, the churches I got to play in, the cities I got to go to, I mean, unbelievable. Completely in, changed in my life. Your, your 20s, I'm just gonna plug in the 20s thing and then we'll take some questions. Your 20s are the time to do this. Because guess what? Like after your 20s comes your 30s. Did you know that? And then your 40s comes. And then maybe one day your 50s comes. You know, and it's like each phase of life has a different, um, not only things that are going on, but your values change. Like, you know, I know when I was in my 20s, I was like, I don't care about life. All I want to do is play my flute and be a flute player. But, you know, like things start to change and you maybe you move into phases of life where like building a family is more important um or other phases of life you know and there's just something about <clears throat> when you still have that fire and that fire which you'll always have is being applied to your musicianship and your music that's the time to like get out there go over there um you know Later on, potentially you start to build relationship, lifelong relationships. You might build a family, but like the twenties, don't you think Dion? Like, isn't that a good window of opportunity? Absolutely. That is the time to go explore the world. You are in the stage of life where you can be only thinking of yourself. You can be thinking of, you know, how you're going to build your career. You don't have the other obligations of, of you know raising a family or the other things that come along later in life this is your time it's all about you i have two kids in college right now and i keep telling them you know this is it like explore the world do whatever you can you know you're in your 20s and um it's true so really please there are so many and the other thing there's scholarships besides the fulbright and the rose scholarship i remember digging there's so many grants out there 
um, that are available that people don't even apply for because they don't know about it. So, you know, there's just, there's so many opportunities, but you have to look for the resources. Now, I think it's wonderful that your university has a Fulbright office. I mean, how wonderful that, that those people are there just to help you in this process. We also have um, a grant office that all they do, literally the entire office, all they do is like keep spewing information to us faculty and to students who are connected as to like all the kinds of grants that are out there. I mean, it's, it's a huge deal here at WVU. So great. You know, My son, I just want to quickly say he uh, goes to Northeastern University in Boston and he spent his first semester in the NU international program. He started college in Australia. And, you know, if I listen to like people in my family are like, you can't send him away for his first semester in college. He's going to be so lost. He's, how could you do that? And I was like, no, I think it's wonderful. And everyone was against it. And he went, he had the time of his life and he cannot wait to apply for another study abroad. He absolutely thrived. So yes, this is your time. Go out there, explore the world, find your passion, learn another culture, learn another language. This is all part of being a musician and an artist. It all will create who it is that you become in the end. And if, if you're afraid of the full year thing, which is a, a reasonable potential fear, if you even use that word, um, there are other things. You can go for three weeks, two weeks. You know, we have the Kennedy scholarship, scholarship here where they pay for you to I think like $2,500 and you can go do some master classes in the summer. And so let's open it up for questions. Um, we've got potentially another 10 minutes. I don't want to keep us much past 4.30. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Juan, why don't you go first? Uh, hi, Dion. It's nice to meet you. Hi. Um, so I'm currently researching into going abroad to Spain or potentially um, other European countries um, to study. And I'm finding out that a lot of um, like how master's programs work um, here in the United States isn't really the same uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are the different options that you would recommend looking at for something like that? Okay, so in, in France, uh, the educational system is completely different. For example, I already had my bachelor's degree when I got into the Paris Conservatory. So when I got into the Paris Conservatory, they don't give out degrees, they just give out prizes. So you have to compete to get your diploma, it's called. Um, and once that's done, they have a thing called the uh, Poisium Seek or the performance cycle. So you can apply and then you, it's two years where you just study with the professor and it's like you're a student, but you're not really associated with that, that first cycle of having to get the prize. It's basically, it's an advanced study program it's for performers that just wanna perform and get a performance certificate. So you will, you will have to do some research because the way things transfer aren't exactly the same. Because like, for example, I have a bachelor's degree, but I also have my first prize. They're both considered basically the same thing. So you could say I have two bachelor's degrees, you know, but um, I wouldn't worry so much about what it's called. It's really just about the experience of you getting with a teacher in the country you want to study with, learning the culture, listening to the flutist, making those connections, playing in a foreign country, learning about the culture. I mean, I can remember the first week I was in France, I was so tightly up, wound up tight because I, I didn't speak the language. And I remember going to the post office and I was about to lose my mind because everything there moves 50 times more slowly than here. I don't need if that was your experience in Germany, but. Oh yeah, and you need to stand for, you needed to stamp for everything. Like if you. Oh, the bureaucracy like, and the forms and signing things. Oh my gosh. And I remember thinking, I can't believe I have to spend 30 minutes waiting in line to send a letter when I need to be practicing. And it was like, either I was going to go crazy and lose my mind, or I had to accept this is how they live their life. They hate being rushed they will not allow you to feel rushed. Like if I was gonna survive there, I had to adapt to their way of life, which is they take a nap, you know, from three to six, everything closes down from 12 to two, people eat for three hours at a time. I mean, this was completely foreign to me and it took me a while to figure it out. But once I accepted that my way of life wasn't necessarily the only way to live, to be stressed out constantly and waiting for every minute I could practice, but that there was actually a way to live life where you can still practice and enjoy time with people and take time to have coffee with others and make connections with others. It's not all about staying in a practice room eight hours a day. I think that, that for me, that was the most important thing I had to learn. And um, so, yeah, there's just, 
there's yeah. so many. And also related to a different thing that they do over there that we don't do here, except for in distinct schools. And I think Yale is one of them and Curtis is another. But um, the way it operates for the most part over there is that if you pass your exams, you don't pay for school. So once you're accepted, and when I say you don't pay, maybe it's like 400 euro. And I think, I think Patricia, Patricia, are you user one? Are you here? <laughs> okay, so I was having this conversation with- Yes, you. yes, yes, here I am. Oh, would you mind? Do you want to chime Hi. in? Oh, you want to chime in for a second? Like, sure. So at your school, they don't, and Patricia is going to be our guest um, in a few weeks or whenever it is. Mm. But uh, the, the, the students take the exams and they can take lessons and be in the Paris system for free, right? Or yeah. No, no, it's 500 euros a year. A year. Yeah. By the way, for those of you who don't know what a euro is, what is that? $600? Yes. <laughs> but I must say that in the Paris Conservatory now, it's not a system of prize. They, they, they have rebounded uh, towards the American system, uh, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. You're kidding. No. And it, 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 so after you do your three years of study, sorry, I'm, not central, I'm in my basement, <laughs> sorry. It's not very elegant. But um, um, after three years of study, you, you can take your exam, which is like, it's called the recital of the prize. But yeah. you're most likely to get it. And you just get a mention either bien or très bien. Ah, huh. So in my day, it was free. I didn't pay a thing. I didn't pay anything. If you were accepted into the class of La Marion, tuition was free. So the Fulbright money that I was given to pay for education, I was able to use to do some traveling and, you know, explore some of the other cities that I couldn't have afforded to explore without that opportunity. So um, anyway, yeah. It's so nice to meet you. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to meet you. Great, Great yes. class. I yeah. loved it. In Germany, they've done the same thing. They've switched over to the American system and it's caused quite a havoc over there. I, I, Pat, I'm curious to know how much the French hate the American system. Because <laughs> oh. in Germany, like all the flutists and all the musicians are just so upset that the whole system of like the Meisterklasse and podium and like the conservatory tradition has been confined to all this academics and- Yeah, yeah. exactly. There's a big thing that happened in Paris Conservatory where they had to go to the American system. There, all the students were crazy going, I cannot go to university and take other subjects besides music. I'm not going to waste my time. I cannot practice enough. And they, they had to really, um, I think they made concessions. Because if you're always in a classroom doing something else, you're not practicing your flute. And that's why the level is very high here. It's, it's so true. High. Yeah. Don't you think so, Dion? Oh, I, I, I don't know if you heard the beginning of the class, but I, I, I was saying how the first time I stood in the class at, in Marion's class at the Paris Conservatory and I heard the 12 other flutists in the class, I was terrified by the level. I couldn't believe how good every single person was. I mean, the level of playing was just, it blew my mind. And then I had Musique d'Analyse with this woman, Madame Solange Capron. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Oui, yes, of course. She was a student yeah. of Messiaen, and ah, she yes. would work with me like five hours on Sunday so I could catch up with my solfege and keep up with my classes because I was, I was just scared the entire first year I was there. I, I just was terrified the whole time. So um, that she was, you know, and also this, I think this is interesting just to say is that like Madame Capron and even Raymond Guillot, the teachers that I that I had were so passionate about music. They never once asked for me to pay for a lesson or they, it was all done from their heart. Like they're so passionate about imparting the history and the people they studied with and, and passing that on to the next generation that, I mean, no one ever talked about charging a fee or, or money. It's not about that there. It's about, it's about imparting the history and the traditions that exist and how to become the best musician you can be. And that for me really changed my life. I will never forget what Madame Sian Solange Capron did. And also my chamber music, Christian Lardé, for example, he had studied the Poulenc Sonata with Poulenc himself. I mean, it was like crazy. <laughs> I know it's great. It's, it's just incredible. But I think for flutists, I think, I'm sorry to be very chauvinistic. The best country is probably France. 
Oh, <laughs> because of the tradition. Absolutely. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, no, absolutely. That's what I, I mean, that's what I've spent my career doing is teaching, you know, doing master classes where I do Guillaume's technique classes where we stand in a circle, oh. play, you know, gamze arpege and all yeah. different rhythms, octaves, you know, different keys, changing patterns. I mean, he did that upside down and, and not. And absolutely. I know, Nina, we talked about, you thought, well, maybe that's not very healthy, but in a way, like I said, that has, why my career went the way it did is because I because I had these skills and I came back to the United States I could sight read Daphne and Chloe in one day in the concert with the Chicago yeah. Symphony. Well, we, we also had and we have a technique jury here in at WVU which is happening next week it's not as intense but but Dion we also had those classes with Peter Lloyd I don't know if you remember it was Monday nights it was like two and, two and a half hours of like Oh crap, yeah. now we're doing our fourths and sixths and fifths and we had to stand, I think we stood in a circle or at least we stood behind each other and it was just, it was just like two hours of like. That's where he yeah. got that because he studied yeah. Car Carje. He got that from the French system. I mean, he was trained in the French system, even though it was English and he played in the London Symphony, his background was the French yeah. school. Yeah. So yeah, that's where that all came from. Yeah. But yep. just think of that times like 50 on another level. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So, well, we're, um, any more questions? I think we'll take one more. And then, uh, Patricia, we're so looking forward to having you also. These times just, I'm glad, Dion, that you were able to stay another half hour because this well, whole I, discussion is just say, so I want to meet Patricia so badly. And like, t I wish I could talk to you more because I love, I'm, I, I just am so envious that you got to stay in Paris and you teach there and you live there in France. It's like, it's a dream of mine. I will retire probably in Lille, but somewhere in France. And but Boston is like France. <laughs> it is similar. Yeah. So Patricia, just so I, I don't know if most of us know, is actually born, raised, everything in, in the United States, even though she has a French accent. <laughs> I think so. But she no. I'm from yeah. Boston. I'm her. from Boston, of course. Boston is very French. <laughs> It yeah. is. <laughs> she, she's one of the lucky ones who got to stay and develop yeah. the whole entire career. Yeah. When, when we have you as a guest um, artist, we're looking forward to hearing about how do you how do you stay in Europe? <laughs> yeah. Can I can I come to that class too, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, one more question, Ethan. Did you have your hand up? Go ahead. Okay, so I was I have a question about the Fulbright. So I've been doing um, research on getting a Fulbright and. I kind of have like two questions in one. I found that like it has to be research based or teaching based. That's that's what I thought. And then when should you start thinking about it? Because I've heard a lot of different opinions or like when should you start the Fulbright application? As soon as possible. Do not wait. For example, I think I have um, like The Simple Flute by Michelle DeBost. I don't know if you've ever read that book, but read as many books as you can uh, that were written by people who studied in the French system and do your, do your history research on how the French flute school got started, like with Tafnel and Gobert and Moïse and how that all, um, how that all impacted what the French flute school and the system is like today. Make sure you're educated on that because the Fulbright committee, if you don't have a compelling argument, they're going to say, well, why didn't you apply to go to, um, Yugoslavia because it's easy, you know it's less competitive to get a Fulbright to Yugoslavia maybe than it is to go to France so you're you know Germany and France and England those are the three most competitive countries so you know if, in Spain too I think but you just want to make sure that to make yourself competitive you have to do a ton of research like Nina said she had 21 pages of research that she had to cut down into one page for the Fulbright application yeah and you start you know when you start you start in high school I'm, I'm being funny, but I'm also not being funny. I mean, everything that we do in terms of how we build our resume here and, and how we're always talking about leadership, service, accolades, you just, you start. But in order to, and also to answer your question, Ethan, you might be looking at the wrong kinds of Fulbrights because um, the teaching Fulbright is something that I might apply for or that Dion might apply for to go already as an established teacher into another country. So that's out for you. The research one might be what you're looking for. I'm not quite sure. I'd have to see what you've seen. Um, but of the two, yours would be the research one. Um, and you can only get it 
after your master's and after your, I'm sorry, after your undergrad and after your master's, I don't think you can get one after a doctorate unless you are then formally a lecturer who goes over and does a sort of teaching exchange thing. So again, just the sooner the better. And um, like Dion said, there's so many other ones. The Rotary Foundation Scholarship is actually better than a Fulbright in a lot of ways because they literally set concerts up for you and you end up becoming a true ambassador. And Oh, and can I just jump in? There's another grant called the Harriet Hale Woolley Grant. I don't know if it's still around, but so I only had the Fulbright for the first year. And so I had to find a grant to stay to finish so I could pass my prize. I needed one more year of money. I didn't have any money. And that was the grant that I received for the second year. And with that grant, you actually get housing in the Fondation des Etats Unis, the United States Founda Foundation. Um, you get to live there for free and give concerts. And in exchange for giving those concerts, they pay for a year of your living expenses. So that's another one to look into. Again, do a lot of research. There's so many grants out there. It's not just the Fulbright and the Rotary. There's lots of other ways you can end up going there if, if you so desire. And um, yeah, and once you get, um, Ethan, once you sort of get hooked into the right research offices here, which is what you probably should do so you save yourself some time, mm -hmm. um, I'd like you to collect that information and put it on our Google Drive so everybody has access to it. And Lydia, you have some information from last year, I'm assuming, um, you know, because we did that research too. But um, all right, well, just to kind of be mindful of everybody's time. Thank you, Dion. It was not enough time. <laughs> we, we should be doing what Raymond Gyo did and just kind of press forward for six hours of great conversation, but we'll yeah. have you back. And you know, these, um, these classes are free and I, we have some visitors, so welcome. Some of them came and left already. Awesome. You know, spread the news. Don't you, don't you wish all your flute player, player friends watched this? I mean, it's inspiring. That's We've recorded it. We're going to find a way to put it up on Facebook. Thank you, Dustin. You just got a little assignment. <laughs> um, you know, we'll kind of keep the love and the, all the great energy going out, especially right now with COVID. Keep, you know, um, offering things to the flute community in your own work, on your own social platforms, and in what we do as a studio. And I want to thank you, Nina, because I think it's fabulous. Number one, that you're offering this to your students, especially during this time where we all feel so disconnected. I, I just, like, I'm inspired from having this conversation with you and all your wonderful students, and from hearing them play. I love listening to the recordings. I mean, fabulous playing, and it made me, you know, uplifted and inspired, too. So thank you all for having me and I hope we meet again. Yeah, thank you. Okay.